Yeah, right over there. Oh, yeah, I guess you got two quick questions. So, one, I just want to know uh, how long did it take to do that famous transformation scene from America's World to London? We were smart. Um, we, that was the, we finished principal photography. We basically finished the movie. <laughs> and then we had five days to shoot. It took five days to shoot. And the reason it took so long is David and Rick, you know, they get up at you know, two in the morning, be at the studio at three, do a makeup, be ready at six <laughs> or seven, and we would be there and we shoot it. And then we go, okay. And then off they'd go for another four hours. <laughs> they'd come back and we'd shoot it. And then there they went for another five hours. And we shot it the last five days, and that was good because it gave them more time to work on it. And we also were able to get rid of a lot of the crew, get rid of a lot of people because it was just that in five minutes. Oh, I just had one other. Uh, yeah. One. I just wanted to know what your experience was making the third uh, Everybody Loves Scott movie. That was a weird experience. That was a, that was a lesson to me because I did it for the money. <laughs> uh, and Eddie and I had a terrible falling out on coming to America. We had a great, great time on trading places, but eight years later, the guy I worked with was the pig of the world. And we had a huge conference, although we always worked together well. And then, you know, I still don't know. I don't know why he was so pissed off. Later told me because I treated him like everyone else. <laughs> it is, you know what? It is true. I treat everyone exactly the same, and a lot of people are offended by that. It's like, he's not kissing my ass, or he's not, you know, or he's not... Like, I wait a moment, I'm a nun, can you say that? You know, it's like, I, just, I don't care who the fuck you are. I treat everybody exactly the same, which is not always good. Got me in a lot of trouble. Well, because he wasn't the star of Freddy, because he's really that an actor, wasn't he? Well, there were a lot of stars on that picture. Yeah. I had Ralph Bellamy and Don Lee. Oh, But, and Denim Elliott, you know, I had a great cast. Anyway, Alfred Drake was mm -hmm. the head of the, anyway. <laughs> he, so he, he was just an asshole, and we had a huge, I mean, he did, if you see that movie, he refused, this is something he learned from Sinatra, he refused to do off-camera for any other actor. He refused to do over-shoulders. Anytime it's over-shoulder, it's his brother Charlie. Woo! Charlie Murphy! <laughs> Charlie Murphy! Charlie Murphy! Just like him at the time. And, uh, and Eddie, it was weird. It got, you know, and I said, look, you, you must do off-camera for James Earl Jones. And he's saying about having new clothes for every shot. That that's not true. That that's not, true. <laughs> that, not on my movie. Well, it was true on Pluto Nash. That's I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. I didn't watch that. Know. Were you there? <laughs> and he wanted new clothes. What? He, 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 he would not wear. They had the costume department had to order stuff like seventy-five copies of the same shirt because he would not wear a laundered shirt. He had to have a new shirt every time. He also had extras fired if they looked at him like a pharaoh. You had to what did you avert do your eyes show? when Eddie... <coughs> what did you do on that show? Hey? What were you doing? I was an extra. <laughs> but also... So you're completely <laughs> reliant. <laughs> Ask me. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I think that's for sure. I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. I can't answer. I've never had that experience. But, but the, thing, the thing was that... Uh, actually, if you see Coming to America, it's interesting because it's all me. I mean, the entire thing is me, only I'm off, you don't see me, because when you see me, I'm either the girl or the queen or whoever I am. But, they should, and, in the, and I didn't do any opticals in that picture, and, you know, and Eddie's playing eight roles. You know, that, that's an interesting, that's the best story. Which is, in pre-production, I saw Spike Lee was on television. And Spike, the best thing I ever heard about Spike was from Angela Bassett. I worked with her, and she had just worked on Malcolm X. And she said, people misunderstand Spike. They think he's an angry black man. He's not. He's an angry short man. <laughs> anyway, so working, Spike was on television and he was talking about blackface, the whole theatrical conceit of blackface. And he said something so ignorant and outrageous. He said that uh, blackface was basically done by Jews and Jewish actors like Eddie Cantor, Al Jolson, so that old Jews could play young black men. It's like... What? It's like, what? I was so offended that I came in the next day. I said, Eddie, you're a young black man. Can you sound like an old Jew? And he went, what? I said, can you do a Yiddish accent? He can do, he's a genius mimic. And he said, yeah, I guess. So I said, okay, you're playing an old Jew in the movie. Why? I said, just because I'm pissed off. <laughs> so he said, I can do it, but I don't know how we make it real. I called Rick Baker, I said, could you make Eddie Murphy an old Jewish guy? He said, a, a black or white old Jewish guy? I said, a white one. 
<laughs> and he's actually, you know who he is? Um, Sylvia, Sylvia Baker, his wife. Uh, her father, I think, I, I think they're Italian or Sicilian or something, but her father was very old and he, he modeled the, the Saul, the old Jewish guy, on her, her father, even though it's a sculpture. So in some shots, that's her father sitting there. <laughs> and, and anytime we're tied on him, it's Eddie. But the head of the studio, Paramount, gave me ten thousand, fifty thousand, sorry, fifty thousand dollars to shoot a test, and it was an amazing experience. As, as Rick was making him up, Eddie was becoming this old Jew, and it, he was hysterically funny. And someone has that. I wanted them to put that videotape on the DVD, but they wouldn't because it's so dirty. But but he's sitting there and he's watching it. And he's becoming this old Jew, and then he turns to me and goes, "Wait a minute!" And he looks and says. I've got shreds in that! <laughs> and then when we finished it, he then went around the studio hitting on secretaries. <laughs> it was really funny. So they, as soon as I saw that that would work, I said, I actually fired four actors. I said, Eddie, you're playing this guy, you're playing this guy. And Arsenio said, well, I want to play. So Arsenio played three guys, and poor Rick. But anyway, but there's no opticals in that movie. It's, I just did it cut for cut, you know. I, there was no special bags, there's nothing which is doubles and over the shoulders. Why I'm telling you is that I'm not. <laughs> we had a big falling out on that movie, so ten years later, eight years later, when I got the call from Sherry Lansing, would you do Beverly Hills Cop 3? I said, who's playing Eddie Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, no, Eddie asked me. And I went, what? And uh, so I met Eddie, and he was, he was married then, had a bunch of kids, it was different. And, uh, I think it was his way of a pop. I actually saw Eddie last week, so we're friends now. It's weird, but but he, I think it was his way of apologizing to me. I'm not sure because what happened was it was a terrible script, and I said, well, they wanted the film and they wanted it like in four. I mean, they wanted it right away. They had a. It's complicated, but the Eddie Murphy covers. They knew they would, you know, they project, box. They figure out how much they can get, and they they wanted it right away, and the script was terrible. And there was no, it's like, can we rewrite it? And then, have you ever seen Beverly Hills Cop? Yeah. yeah. That's a really funny movie. That's a terrible script. One of the worst scripts I've ever read. And if you watch the movie, everything funny in it came from Marty Brest, the director, or Eddie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything funny. And then he cast Judge Reinhold, who's funny. And you, you know that whole thing with Serge? Yeah. yeah. Bronson Pinchot was an extra. Mm -hmm. wow. That's all improvised. And then the stuff with uh, the way the, the way in the brothers and stuff that was all made up. All that stuff, you know, something with banana. Remember, everything yeah. funny in that movie was made up. So I figured, well, we could do that. And then what happened was, like, the first day of filming, I said, Eddie, do this, and he went, No, I, no, why not? He said, Well, it's wise ass, you know. I said, You're Axel Foley, you're a wise ass, and I'm, it was like the Arctic wind. And he said, No, Axel's a man. <laughs> oh, you're so far. <laughs> and what it was, it was actually interesting. It took a couple of weeks. Eddie wanted to make action movies. So if you watch that movie, it's I think it's a weird movie. I had a strange time making it because it was like, gee, I'm making this bad movie. You know? The only thing I like in that picture is playing with Disney and Wonder World. And I also like the... Uh, this, I hired the Sherman brothers to write Wonder World, and they wrote that song, and I love Hector going, will you turn that fucking music off? <laughs> How about George Lucas? He was in there for like a he second. He made the picture. Yeah. He uh, saved the movie, George. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for one last question. Someone new? Yeah, right there. What's next? I actually, the money came through last week, so I'm in a panic. I go August 8th back to England. And I'm making a really esoteric movie this time. You thought this was twee. Wait till you see this. How many people are familiar with Sheridan, the, the restoration she stoops to conquer? I'm doing The Rivals. And it's uh, 1775, it's 100, 100 years before this. It takes place in uh, Bath and London. It's all Georgian. It's like all, you know, this is, I go, oh my God, every man's wearing a wig. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it's, it's, good. it's restoration. Do you know it, the movie? Yes. Do you know the word malaprop? Yes. All right, Mrs. comes from the play. Mrs. Malaprop is a character in it. It's going to be played by Imelda Stone. Thrill. I have Albert Finney, 
Joe Fines, Jim Atherton. Um, it's going to have a superb cast, and it's going to look great. But it's a restoration comedy, and I'm sure like <laughs> it's going to be talk about your art house. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to have good sword fighting and horses. Have you, have you ever read? Uh, have you ever seen it on stage? Yes. It's very funny, but what, what happens in the rivals is they talk about what happened off stage. So it's like there was this terrible duel. So we'll show the terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but it's an esoteric, it's really a strange one. It's what they got the money for. You know, it's it's harder and harder for filmmakers to make movies, unless I want to make you know, my own little low-budget experimental movies or something, which I, I did that, I thank you, when I was a teenager already. It, it's hard. I mean. Last year, Joe Dante, John Carpenter, and I all made for our, John 10 years, Joe 11 years, me 12 years. It was our first movie in years because, and all independent, two in Canada, one in England. And uh, the studio is not hiring filmmakers with opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to make, I mean, I'm offered, I don't want to make a superhero movie, I'm sorry. <laughs> I like them, you know, but like, like let's take two, Spider-Man and Iron Man, both made by friends of mine. Both movies I really like, but once he's in the fucking suit, flying around, they're the same movie. You can take all these superhero movies and cut scenes, you know, no one would know. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> I like that stuff, but it's the studios, they don't want, they're not interested. You know, how, what's that wonderful movie about Mark Zuckerberg? Um, uh, how that got made, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, Beverly Hills Cop 3 was the most expensive movie I ever made. It cost $50 million, 25 of which went to Eddie Murphy. Wow. Wow. And do you know why they haven't made Beverly Hills Cop 4? <laughs> By the way, that movie made a lot of money. And you know why they haven't made Cop 4? This time he gets 30. <laughs> and his profits are so big that this... Do you know when... Remember that thing when Sumner Redstone and Paramount fired Tom Cruise? Mm -hmm. He was so weird, and that's bullshit. It was because Tom's deal, they could not make money on these movies. There's a movie now, Cowboys and Aliens. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that universal, I think? All right, you've got Imagine, so you've got Ronnie Howard, you got Spielberg, you got... The studio's not going to make any money on this picture. you got Harrison Ford, you have all these gross players. The studio cannot make money on that movie. They'll sell toys, maybe that will make money on it. But, you, but so, it's become so complicated, you know, studios, you know, I, it sound, I don't, at the time I was unaware of it, but in the 70s, I was very lucky to come into what was called Hollywood in the 70s because of the collapse of the studios. They were run, when I made Animal House, you look at the movies Universal made within two or three years of Animal House, Missing, American Graffiti, um, gosh, so many, Cat people, that was a weird one. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think, no, there was like, they made so many, like, really, <laughs> Melvin and Howard, I mean, really good movies, a lot of silly movies too, but you look at the, you look at movies like, you look at Network or Chinatown, those pictures would not be made now. No studio would make them. And it's just true. I mean, when I made American Werewolf, I made it independently because no studio would allow that ending. And then they ended up Universal bought it from me because they said, this movie's making too much money. You can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it, it's just this very shitty time now. And because of streaming and all the new delivery systems and Comcast, people buying Murdoch, you know, it's all going to be owned by three guys. And it's a very weird time. But it's also evolving. So I'm not pessimistic about it because I think it's always changing and always evolving and, and good movies are always made. Did you see Let the Right One In? Yeah. yeah. How good was that? Well, it's just like, oh, you see a movie like that, you go, oh, they are making good movies. I love that. But like, so you see good movies all the time from, from all over the place. And so, you know, I love movies. I'm like the biggest movie <laughs> there is. Anyway, thank you very much.